What's up, everyone? How's it going? How are we all doing today? Hey, TJ, how's it going? Thanks to everyone who is here live. It's good to be here. Good to see you all. Hey to Alex, Cedric, Marcelo, and First Drafts. Welcome to April's live stream. I can't believe it's April already. It's good to be back. It's good to be back from Vegas as well. So for anyone who doesn't know, I got back Friday night from NAB, uh, which is an amazing event hosted in Vegas. I was presenting on the Maxon booth and it was just so much fun getting to chat with all of you amazing people, getting to hang out with the Maxon team and just see some cool artists. So today... Today I'm going to do a little bit of a NAB 2.0. So if you didn't see that presentation, then all good. If you did, there's going to be a little bit of an overlap, uh, but I'm going to cover a bunch of stuff that I didn't actually get around to, just like lighting and more detail about AOVs and things like that. So on screen right now, somewhere here, <laughs> is the final render I created which was part of a collaborative project with myself, Ian Robinson, Chad Perkins, and Anna Carolina. So we put together this whole pipeline covering the Max on One tools, also incorporating Substance Painter and incorporating Unreal Engine. And we put this together for NAB. And we went back to back and we did our hours and we covered a bunch of different things. My part of this pipeline, this process, was to take the hero assets, that Ian created in ZBrush, build a 3D environment in Cinema 4D, light and texture in Redshift, uh, put together Substance Painter textures, and then create and configure AOVs. And as you can imagine, in kind of like 45, 50 minutes, it's kind of hard to cover all that. And so the perks of having this live stream at the end of the month is I can now redo some of it, talk about things in a lot more detail and then cover all the stuff that I didn't get around to, uh, such as some of the materials and all of the lighting. And then we can talk a bit about AOVs. Also, we have the perks of having this chat system now. So you can ask me questions and uh, we can keep it interactive like we like to do. So also, hey to Hannah, Thomas, Oldaz, a space and Paula, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, always appreciate the lovely comments from, from you all. Cool, okay, so, so I'm gonna start off by talking about assets, models, materials, all those different things. And in particular, how we can customize these. So if like me, you're not advanced when it comes to modeling, whether it's like hard surface or or even sculpting in ZBrush or in Cinema 4D. Using assets and kit bashing or using primitive shapes is always a really nice place to start. And so when I was looking at building up this scene, I was thinking, okay, what do I have access to? And also what do I want to create? And so I knew I wanted this, this island in the middle for a hero character to sit on, but I didn't have an island model. And so I want to take you through some really quick and easy ways of just building your own assets, building your own uh, models using existing things that we already have, whether it's going to be primitive shapes or whether it's going to be things inside the asset browser. So here I've got a scene just with a few rock elements in, and these can all be found for free inside the asset browser. So if I search the word stone, you can see we have some stone models. And they're actually already textured and prepped for Redshift. So if you use Redshift, then these are good to go. For me, I'm actually going to texture these completely differently myself. So I just took the textures off and I've just got them as plain assets. So think of these like our primitive shapes. They're just a little bit more advanced and they've got some more details, but we're gonna be able to customize them, enhance them, explore our creativity and put them together like Lego pieces really easily without having to have too much advanced knowledge on modeling, which is my sweet spot. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna move these around and I'm going to start to build and create the shape uh, that I'm happy with. So I'm gonna leave this one where it is and we're gonna just move everything together using our different move, scale and rotate tools. So I'm just using my shortcuts to move these around. 
And this is where I can exactly choose sort of how I want this to look based on these. I wanted the island to, to come to a point. So bigger at the bottom and smaller at the top. And then I knew I wanted to have my hero character sat on top. And so I'm bearing all of that in mind as I'm just repositioning some of these elements. Maybe we can pull these up. And I'm just gonna do this a little bit quickly. Originally, this took me a little bit more time because I was taking a bit more care, but with you all watching, you don't wanna watch me doing this too long. And then the final one, we're gonna just pull back. And there we go. Something a little bit like this. So now we've created our, our island. We've created our rock. But at the moment, the trouble is everything is just a separate element. So if we come in close, we can see that we're not getting any nice smoothing. They're not meshing together. But what we can do is we can take advantage of one of our tools, one of our generators inside of Cinema 4D, and then we can combine all of these elements together. And that is our volume builder. Let me just make those a little bit bigger for everyone. So what I want to do is whatever I want to mesh and combine and blend together, I'm going to be putting inside of the volume builder. And what this is gonna do, it's going to convert this into what we call voxel data or a voxel grid. That's why we can see all these little squares here. The voxel size or the resolution of this and the amount of detail is based on our voxel size. And this is also scale dependent. So bear this in mind, because these stones are quite small, I'm going to need to reduce my voxel size quite a lot to bring that detail out. So let's go down something like 0.2. And now we can see, we're starting to see that shape take place. But at the moment, it's still only a voxel grid. It's only voxel data. And what that means is if I hit render, we don't see anything. So we need to convert this into a mesh. And the way that we can do that is by taking the volume mesher and again, just combining everything together. And now we can see, if we come in close, our objects are starting to merge together. They're starting to combine and create one individual mesh. The trouble is at the moment, it's not really looking very smooth. We need to apply a smoothing filter and we can do that inside of the volume builder. So we have the SDF smooth. If we add that, it's gonna smooth out our mesh. The trouble is it's actually smoothing this a little bit too much. So what we can do is we can control the strength if we need to. We can control the operator, which is the smoothing uh, algorithm. What we can do to bring back some more detail, we can actually reduce the voxel distance back down to one. And you can see we're getting, uh, a, we're getting more details and we're getting less smoothing. If we wanna bring out even more detail, this is where we'd need to come back to our voxel size and maybe drop it down again to something like 0.1 and then we get more detail. This is what I ended up doing in the final. I had a voxel size of 0.1, but for the sakes of this, just to make sure everything's nice and smooth and fast, I'm gonna leave it back on 0.2. Cool. So the trouble is if I hit NB, that's a shortcut to show our wireframe. It's gonna show our mesh or our subdivisions. Working with the volume builder, we don't get what we call clean topology. So clean topology is nice, even quads over the whole surface of our model. So we can see we get some around here and some around here, but we get some of these little edges that aren't very clean, aren't very even. But what we can do, another sort of like quick and easy way of retopologizing this is to grab the remesh and recently we added the Z remesher algorithm from ZBrush. And what this is going to do, if I drop my volume mesher into my remesh, depending on how high resolution it is, will depend on how long this will take. 
What it's going to do is it's going to completely retopologize this and give me a really nice, clean looking mesh. And then what we can do is we also have control of different options. So as we can see, we have nice, clean topology now. And I haven't really had to do anything. I just used the Z remesher, threw it in there, and now we're good to go. We can even control the mesh density. So in a previous stream, when we were doing the Nike text simulation, we created our letters and then we controlled the mesh density. This is really useful when it comes to UVing. And it's also really useful when it comes to simulation because you don't want to have a really high subdivided model when we're working with simulation because it'll be really slow. We can even add symmetry. So what we can do, we can ensure that our mesh is going to be symmetrical. Again, really useful for creating edge loops and ed or edge selections and UVing. In our case, my object or my model isn't symmetrical at all, so I can't do any of that. But now we're good, we're good to go. Cool, also just quickly, yes. So I'm covering some of the stuff that I did at NAB, but I'm also going into more detail on the materials and how we can customize and build those more. Uh, a lot more detail on the AOVs, and I'm also showing the lighting process, which is, I didn't cover at all. Cool, so. At the moment, this is procedural, which means I could actually add more elements inside of my volume builder and it will continue to work and update. But what I want to do is I actually want to add some detail, I want to sculpt some detail into this. Uh, and so to do that, I need to turn this into a single polygonal object, which is what these stones were originally. originally. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to right click my remesh and then I'm gonna to go to current state to object. Now what it's done is it's created a single polygonal object based on this remesh. And then I'm just going to group that into a null and hide that away. Oh, so we could be happy with this, how it is. We could leave it as it is. But as I said, I wanna add a little bit more detail. So we could do this inside of the material, but I wanted to take advantage of using some of the sculpting tools and using some of the things that I haven't really played around too much with inside of Cinema. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna to go to our sculpt menu and then we're gonna select our object. And then what we can do, so the higher resolution and the more subdivided your model, the more detail you'll be able to get and the more movement and manipulation we'll be able to do. So we can come in and we can just sculpt we can subdivide this just once more. And as you can see, it's still, it's still really fast to work with. Now we have a higher poly model. I can come in and I can begin to manipulate it with my different brushes. So I have my grab brush and the increasing and decreasing the size works the same as Photoshop. So if you're used to working in Photoshop and you have the open and the closed brackets, you can see that we can adjust this size just like we can brushes inside of there. And I can begin to move and manipulate this. And again, just really sort of begin to create a model that I am completely happy with and a completely unique asset that no one's going to have, even though it's started off as shapes and assets that we had inside of the asset browser. We can then do some smoothing if we want to, but the thing I really wanna show really quickly is this draw brush. And inside this draw brush, we have some presets. So in this preset, we do we have cracks, we have craters, we can come down, we have fabrics. Some of these are patterns that we can draw, some are textures, some are stencils. If I search rocks, we have this rock stencil and I can just double click and then now we can see we have this stencil, which I can then begin to draw on top of my model. What I am gonna do though, so I find being able to see the stencil is a little bit distracting. Uh, some people like to keep it on, but if you're like me and you don't wanna see this, you just wanna kind of play around and, and paint and draw and, and whatever, then you can come into the stencil and then you can just either increase the transparency or just switch off visible. And then I can come in, I can 
change my strength to maybe something a little bit smaller. And I can just begin to paint and draw over the surface of my rock, adding some of that rocky detail. I may want to smooth, reduce this down a little bit. And so the more or the heavier I press down, the more I press down, you'll see we get a more intense amount of uh, detail and sculpting going along. But we can just sort of Command Z or Control Z, and we can just start to paint and draw around. And I love this. I really think this is like if if you're an artist and you just want to be creative, you just want to add some detail and some texture, then that this is like a, I, I love this workflow. I love this process. And then we can even come in and we can add more over the top. So let me just switch that off, reduce that down, and I can add a different layer now. Let me just move that up so you guys can see it in there. There we go. Now we can do some craters over the top as well. So we can layer this up and add some more detail and add some more texture. And so if you've never sculpted before, if you're not very experienced in Cinema 4D sculpting or ZBrush, then this is a nice little ease in to just begin to manipulate your assets. Cool. Right, so. So this was the process behind how I created that, that rock island, uh, just by spending a little bit more time on that. So now I want to talk a little bit about the mushrooms, but just quickly to comment on the chat. Am I still rocking the iMac for my workflow? No, I'm not still rocking the iMac. I moved over to my M1 MacBook Pro. And so that's what I'm currently using. And... I don't have a 3D mouse. I use a Sense Labs pen tablet. So maybe I can get this up. It's plugged in at the moment, but this is what I'm currently using. Sense Labs medium pen tablet. I got my little, my little spinny wheel here with some shortcuts on. But yes, that's what I am currently using. No longer am I on the iMac though. Cool. So moving on, I want to really quickly talk about how I customize these mushroom assets. So these were sculpted by Ian. Those of you who were part of last month's live stream will recognize this, this little mushroom guy where we procedurally textured it. This time it was actually textured in Substance Painter. And so what that means is I need to ensure that the UVs remain intact. So when it comes to customizing this type of asset that has textures already created for it. We need to be careful. We don't just have free reign to kind of go crazy and do whatever we want, because then if the UVs are messed up, our texture maps won't then project and, and link correctly. But there's still some things that we can do. So when I first started off using this asset and started building the scene, I did what I'm sure a lot of people do and what I've done many, many times, threw it inside of a cloner, and then I used a randomize to randomize my position, scale, and rotation. I love that workflow. It is so good. It is so perfect for adding multiple different elements. But what I found was I didn't have enough control. I didn't have enough variation. And I wanted to define things a little bit more, especially as these were the hero assets. I went with the cloner method for the mini mushroom. That worked perfect. But for these, I wanted more variation. And so I'm going to show you how I set up a, a slightly different way of creating variation for this that gave me a little bit more control. So let's just hide my mini mushroom for now. And we're going to take our hero mushroom. Let's just move it to the middle. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break this apart into different sections. And the reason I can do that is because when Ian modeled it, he modeled it in three different parts, the top bit, the underneath bit and the stem. If anyone knows what the top bit's called in the chat, please let me know. For now, it's gonna be like the hat because it's like the little, you know. Cool, so what that means is I can actually break this apart into different elements. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna select my hero mushroom. We're gonna to go to tools, convert, polygon islands to objects. Again, I showed this in the last stream and it is such a cool quick tip. And now we have a little drop down we can see we have our three different pieces. I can just delete this main one. And now this is what we have. 
we've separated these different elements. So let me just hide the, the hat and leave the stem. And what I'm going to do, I wanted to create the idea of some movement and some flow based on some feedback Chad gave me about understanding kind of like the order of flow in a composition. And so I thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice to add some slight rotation to the stem? And so the way that I did that was to take a helix. So inside this menu, you have a bunch of uh, preset splines. These are like paths inside of Illustrator. And if I take a helix, change the plane to X, Z, and then just scale this all the way down, I can then just reposition this, add some height, and then maybe we can pull down the end angle. Again, it doesn't need to be perfect. All of this can be tweaked later on. Mushroom parts, cap, gills, stalk. Thanks, TJ. Cool, so now how do I get it so the stem is following around the helix? Well, inside of this menu here, we have a whole bunch of deformers that are gonna help us deform our geometry. And one of them is called a spline wrap. If we take a spline wrap, what we need to do, we need to make it a child of the object that we want to wrap around a spline. So the object they wanna deform effectively. So we take the spline wrap and we'll make it a child of the stem or the stalk. Getting my mushroom knowledge out now. And then in the spline wrap, it's going to ask us for a spline to wrap the geometry around. This is going to be our helix. So let me put my helix in my spline. And it looks a little bit weird. The reason is, I don't know if you can see, let me come a little bit closer. There is an arrow here. There's an arrow pointing this way, or maybe this way. And the axis of the spline wrap is the X axis. So it's our red arrow. Whereas what we want is we want it to be sort of going up as our stem is or our stalk as is our helix. So all we need to do, nice and simple, inside of our spline wrap, we can change the axis to plus Y. And now we can see, we have that nice spiral. What's happening here is the, the entire stem is actually being swept along the entire length of the helix. And so at the moment, it's stretching it to fill that height of the helix, which could cause some issues. So remember when we talked about our UVs and we're gonna talk about our textures, if we put our texture on now, it may look like it's being stretched because our UVs are being stretched. And so in the spline wrap, we can actually change our mode to keep length and it's gonna keep that length. But I like, some stretching is fine. We have to think about the final outcome. So I like a little bit of that rotation. And I also think because they're going to be a little bit further back, um, and the way that the stem or the stalk is going to look after it's textured, I can probably get away with a little bit of stretching. And so I ended up going to fit spline, but then we can change our two down to maybe like 70%. Maybe we we'll go to that. So now we're getting a little bit of stretching, but I don't think it's gonna be noticeable, but now we're still getting that nice rotation. Okay, so already we've enhanced it, made it look different, and we've started to create some variation. The next bit is we now need to put our cap, our cap back on. So what we can do is we could reposition this by eye, we could move it, we could rotate it, but why do that when we can take advantage of another feature inside of Cinema 4D that's gonna do this for us? So I'm gonna take my two top parts. I'm just going to group them inside of a null by pressing option G. Hopefully you can see at the very top. So as I sort of press my keys, you can see them come up as well, but I'll try and say it um, at any point anyway. So they've now been grouped inside of a null. On this null, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna to go to animation tags and align to spline. And what it's gonna do, I'm able to then drop my helix spline in 
And it's going to automatically align these parts of the mushroom to that top bit. Then what we can do, we can define the position. But at the moment, it's not following the rotation. It's only following the position. And so in order to match the rotation, we just have to enable this little option here, which says tangential. Enable that. And then we just need to fix the axis to Y. And now if we move this down, let's just sort of do this so I can see it a little bit better. We now have that on here. So at the moment we're getting some intersection, which is fine, we can fix that. Because with this setup, and the reason I like this setup, our helix has effectively become like a controller. So if I go to my helix, I can now just control and move around some of these different settings to add some variation. Now, all of this is controlled inside of the helix. I can group this all inside of a null, and then we're good to go. And this is what I did on the final design, was I just duplicated, I think, like five or six different versions of this, and then tweaked the helix, and it looked like I had five or six different mushroom assets when really it's all the same one, they just now look completely different. And also, if you're wondering about the fact that we've broken it apart and we've deformed it, is the, or are the texture maps still gonna work or what do we need to do in order to make the texture maps work? Nothing, they're gonna work fine. If we group everything into a null, which I'm gonna show you later on anyway, throw the texture on the null, then it works perfectly. So it's a good little, good little trick. Cool, so those were just some of the assets, um, how I customize those um, and why I customize those. Now, let's get into some lighting. Let me know as well, if you have any questions on, on anything, just let me know. I'm keeping an eye on the chat as much as I am sort of doing this. And uh, you're welcome for me not saying Zed. I, even though I am from England, I'm from the UK. So normally, yes, I would say Zed, but Everyone around me says Z, and so it just it just it flows now. I also spell color without the U, but that's also because of Redshift. I've gone off on a tangent, but yeah, in Nodes, it's spelled the American way, so I spell it the American way as well. Gradually converting. All right, cool. So we don't need uh, any of these. Let's open up. Let's open up the scene and do some lighting. Here we go. <laughs> cool, right, so here is a, a simplified version of the final scene, because the final scene was quite heavy, it was quite big, had a lot of stuff going on. Uh, so I thought I would just simplify it slightly to show this process. So let's just, let's switch our lighting. Well, let's, let's switch it on to begin with, just so I can show you it. And let's make sure everything is, yeah, we're good to go. And then maybe we just make sure the water, yeah, perfect. Cool. Right, so this is, this is the lighting setup. And so I didn't cover any of this at NAB. Uh, I really wanted to, but you have to had to pick and choose. And so I thought, hey, I've got a live stream on Tuesday. Why not take advantage and do some of that? So we're going to do the lighting and then I'm going to create some of the materials, in particular, how we exported them from Substance and how we customize them. And then also diving into some AOV stuff. OK, right. So this is this is what we're going to try and create now. So let me just disable this lighting i'm going to take you through how we do this entirely from scratch so my process was i actually started off with the sun and sky rig and so lately with the new there's a new sky shader that came in in the latest release of cinema 40 and redshift and so i played a lot with that and it really got me into using the sun and sky rig and i find it creates some really beautiful natural lighting which we can then combine with a dome light 
And so my normal process is dome light HDR, but this I wanted to try and explore a little bit more. So inside of here, we can grab the Redshift Sun and Sky Rig. And then already, I just like how this looks. I just really like how this lighting looks in here. And if we click the sky, we can see we have our intensity multiplier, which works in the same way as any intensity light. So we can increase or decrease. So I think I ended up sort of upping this just slightly. And then the model here, this is the new model, PRG Clear Sky. And it's a far more accurate model based on a paper, you know, you know, the technical stuff like it normally is. But what it does do is it accurate, accurately represents sun radiance far better than the previous models did. So what that means is when we create sunset or sunrise or any scenes that has the sun quite low near to the horizon we get a far more accurate sun radiance and it creates a really really nice look what it also allows us to now do is we can now tint the sun and the color whereas before we had to do the color adjustment in the red blue shift which is quite i find was quite like temperamental so the first thing i'm going to do actually is inside of here we can see the horizon. And so what we can do is we can control the horizon height. What we can also do is control the horizon blur. So let me just change that to something like one. And then it's gonna blur out that back line for us. Perfect, it's now gone. Let me just move this a little bit up so we can see this. Before we move over to the sun, and some of the rotation. I want to talk about the ground color because it's quite an important, it's quite an important step. So the think of the ground color, the darker the ground color, the more energy will be absorbed and therefore the less light bounce we're going to have. So imagine we've got a big plane on the floor. We've got our sunlight or our light source. And if we have a completely black material on the plane, as the light source hits it, the energy is going to be absorbed and we're not going to get any light bounce. So we won't get any uh, sort of brightness occurring afterwards. If we do the opposite of that and make this plane completely white, we're going to add some extra light and it's going to brighten up our scene. So I can demonstrate that by changing this ground color to black. So now we can see we have darker areas sort of under here because we're not getting that extra bounce versus if I change it to white. And now hopefully you can see that this is really sort of brightened up this look. And I mean, we don't necessarily need to do that. We can just leave that on like a gray. Cool from here. If I wanted to rotate the sun to the angle of the sun, again, to create maybe like a sunset or a sunrise, inside the sun, inside the sun coordinates, this is where I'd want to start to, to play around with this. So maybe I can rotate this round a little because I want the sun to be coming in from the right-hand side to match the original. And then what I need to do is I'm going to reduce this number so if I go to something like minus eight or maybe even minus six, we've now created this more sunset or sunrise look. Maybe let's, let's move this around a little bit. I've got some values that, here we go, some values that match the original. I'm trying to, I'm trying to replicate it uh, pretty perfectly here for you. So now what we've got is we've, angled the sun down and we've repositioned it. So now we're getting that nice sunlight coming in from the right hand side. And then the final step is inside of the sun. We now have this new sun tint. So this was a new feature in the latest red shift. This wasn't available before. Again, we had to use the red blue shift if we wanted to tint that. But now what we can do, we can just add maybe sort of like a a pinky or an orangey red glow over the top just to create this really nice lighting. And so kind of on this, we 
when we discussed this project and this collaboration, we had reference images, we had a color palette. So I had a rough idea of where I sort of wanted to go in regards to color. But I ended up going a little bit more pastel and a little bit more flat. And my reason for that is I wanted to then boost the colors in, in post. And so I like to do that. I like to take my stills into Photoshop and I do a lot of my color correction there. And then it also allowed Chad to have a more flat image so he can again do some color grading and start to to push that in post so I wasn't I wasn't too bothered about having a completely final finished render um so yeah that's why I'm going with a slightly sort of more flat color palette cool so this was the sullen sky I was I was pretty satisfied with how it is and then I wanted to combine it with a dome light and so inside of the asset browser, I try my best to use as many things from the asset browser as I can. This then allows me to give you these project files um, with no issues, which I'm going to do for this one as well. I'm going to be able to share this with you after this. And so what I wanted to do, I don't normally use the background in a dome light. Normally I would add this later on or I'd add it in camera. But I really liked this HDR image. And I thought, you know what? This looks, let me just let you see that. This looks like it's really going to complement the current color scheme that I have going on. And I also really like the clouds in the background. And I thought, you know what? This is going to save me some time. I'm going to use this as my dome light. And I'm going to use it as my background. And so if we switch that on and then we grab ourselves a dome light. Once that kicks in. And then inside of our dome light, we can drag our HDR image inside of here. And I'm going to leave the background on for now. And then what I want to do and what I would maybe recommend or suggest, especially if it's an outdoor uh, or a landscape scene and you've already got a light source like the sun, try to match the HDR or the dome light to that current light setup. So for example, I've got my sun coming in, my main light source coming in from here. And so what I want to do is I want to rotate my dome light around and now I can see it in my viewport, which is really nice. Round, so it matches where that light source is coming from. Maybe round a little bit further. Cool, and now the dome light, the background, and the sun and sky are all complementing each other. And they're all sort of, they're working together to create this really nice look. Um, even in the dome light, I might actually reduce my intensity down just slightly. Because we've got the two light sources now, I don't necessarily need them both to be really heavy intense. Cool. All right. So from here, from here, my next step is to then add some area lights. Um, I'm going to use area lights to, again, enhance the existing lighting that I've got set up. So in this particular scene, my first, the first part of my area lights, one I'm going to use to create some atmospheric light. So it's going to work alongside the, the dark blues or the dark purples on the left-hand side of my scene. So this is where my, my atmosphere or my atmospheric light is going to be, the opposite side of my light source. And then where my light source is, I'm going to add another area light that's going to help, again, like enhance that and complement it. And area lights work really well to not only brighten up the scene, but to add and bring out details. So you'll find if you have like um, normal maps or bump maps, area lights will help work better to bring out that detail more so than a dome light and a HDR will. So you want to think about combining all of these things together. Cool, so let's, let's add some area lights. I'm just gonna use my four views for this just so I can see everything that's going on. And I'm going to grab an area light. So really quickly, scene scale 
and sizing is pretty important when it comes to things like texturing and lighting inside of any DCC and probably any render, but definitely for Redshift. And so if I just show you, this rock is actually about 60 centimeters in height. And so my little, my little lizard guy, my axle, is also pretty small. So if I go into my scene setup, we can get our character. Let's see, let's get his, let's get the hero mushroom. I can show you. So my hero mushroom is only about 22 or 23 centimeters. And so what this means is I need to ensure that I am adjusting the size of my lights and the intensity of my lights to, to compensate for that. Smaller scene, smaller lights, bigger scene, bigger lights, or bigger intensity. Cool, so let's go back to our area light. And so this is gonna be our atmosphere light. So let's just set this to 100 by 100. My intensity, I'm gonna pull that right down to something like 10. And then I'm going to add a target tag and a null. So the quick way of doing that is this little arrow here. We can add a target tag and null. And then if we select the null and then we go to our dynamic place tool, we can actually place that really easily on this side of our model or this side of our rock and now I can just pull this area light over maybe something like this and let's just kick this off and when that kicks in we may need to pull this back so this is our atmosphere light that we're creating so the opposite side of our light source Maybe we can pull that back. So here we go. This is the light we're now creating on here. We're casting. What I'm going to do, I'm going to match this color to be one of our darker blue colors. And so what you notice on the original scene, none of my lights are white. Absolutely none of them are 100% white. So with this one, I've actually got, I'm actually going to match those colors that I used before. So 75 84 and the number one for one. There we go. Now we can see we're bringing out a little bit more of this detail, but we're keeping the color the same as sort of our atmospheric color. And then what we can do is we can do the same thing on the opposite side to enhance our light source. So again, I'm going to keep this. Still pretty big, about 100 centimeters. Intensity for this one, we're gonna reduce down to maybe something like five. And then the color, we're going to create sort of like a dusty pink. So we're gonna go two, four, five, one, three, one, and one, four, one. More of like a coral pink. And then again, target tag and null. This is just my, this is my cheat way of really easily targeting lights. And let's just put that on there. And now we can move this maybe over this way a little and slightly up. And now let's see how this is looking. Cool. So we can see these area lights are just really working well to enhance the current lighting that we've got. So like if I switch those off, just so we can get a nice little comparison versus switching them back on, we can see how nice that's looking. So this was most of the lighting that I actually ended up doing. It was the dome light, the sun and sky with a little bit of a tint, and then these two main area lights. The only other lighting I did was to highlight some different areas. And so if I pull up 
this final render. So this was then edited a little bit in Photoshop, which is why the colors look like this. So this is what I mean by being satisfied with having a more flat look because I'm going to boost the, the like exposure and the saturation later on uh, in my edit. But what I also did, so you'll notice we've got our hero character here, our Axel, and he's holding a scanner. And so I was thinking, well, if he's got a scanner and he's looking at it, that means he's probably got a screen. And so that screen would be casting light on our character. And so the next step of my lighting is to then begin to add area lights in the areas that need to have that extra lighting. So for example, I've positioned an area light on the scanner facing him, uh, made it really small, reduced the intensity down to something like 10, and I made it a purple light. And what that's doing is it now looks like the scanner's on, but it also highlights the character a little bit more. So it draws our attention a little bit more to him. And then I also, in the middle section, so inside of here, I just threw in another little area light. Again, reduced the intensity quite down to maybe like 10, uh, made it sort of a, a light pink color. And that just worked to, again, brighten up the hero character and brighten up that dark area that I found inside of there. So I wanted to draw the intention uh, of, the, of the viewer to that particular area. And so when it comes to doing that part of your lighting, think of the things that are in your scene. Think of the things that are, you need to cast light. So if you have like a TV screen or a window or a street light, all of those things will need to have area lights on them. And then that will work again to, to help create some realistic lighting. And it will also help to highlight particular areas uh, in your scene as well, like in this case, our character. So that's the, that was the whole process of the lighting. It was actually actually pretty simple if we, if we sort of like look at it and break it down. There was, if I just sort of show you, this was the final setup, if I can just grab that. So this here was the entire lighting setup. So the sun and sky, the dome light, the two area lights for the atmosphere and the sunlight, and then we have our two target tags. And then those two area lights I just told you about, the one that is the scanner, and then the one that is that middle section. That was it. That was the lighting behind this. And I found it created a really nice aesthetic. I really liked how the colors were coming together on this. But really quickly, what before I move on to talking about the textures, sort of, sort of in line, uh, when it comes to lighting, when it comes to texturing, bear in mind that if you have light textures in your scene, so in my case, uh, relatively light, the, the rocks and the water and even the mushrooms to an extent are quite light and bright colors. What that means is that is going to help in, enhance and add more light bouncing. So it's going to work with my lighting here and it's going to create even more lighting. It's going to create more bouncing around and everything will be nicely lit. If I had darker materials, so if I had uh, dark rock, if my um, water was actually like a landscape instead of a reflective water, what it's going to do is that light is going to be absorbed and it's going to bounce less and therefore my scene is going to look darker. And so bear in mind your lighting and your materials will work hand in hand together. This is why you'll find many artists will do materials first, then they do their lighting. Or they do their lighting, then they do their materials. But whatever way you do it, the chances are you may have to come back and do some tweaking. So I did my lighting first, I then did my materials, I then adjusted and customized my materials, and then I went back and tweaked a little bit of my lighting just to make sure everything, everything matched. Cool. So I'm just having a quick look through the chat. Uh, yes, I completely agree on the procedural clouds. That would just be, that would be incredible. My vote, that gets my vote too, 100%. Um, just having a quick look through. 
great system for targeting lights. Yes, I like the I like the quick and easy workflows. Thomas was wondering, could you show how you made the water material? I can show you that right now because it is very, very simple. So let me just go into here, I think. Is this my water? Let me double click that. No, not that one. This is why you should name things. <laughs> um, am I being, it probably is this one actually. It is this one. So let me do that. And then let me actually get the water open for you. Do -do -do. Here we go, water, Little nice. So what I did for this, uh, hi Andy, how's it going? So for the water, again, nice and simple. It is just a plane with my width and height segment set to 200 by 200. I then used a displacer with a noise. So just for you all to see, let me pull this up so you can all see how not special this setup really is. Turbulence, noise on there. Threw that inside of a um, SDS, subdivision surface. Uh, it's just switched off for now, just to make sure everything's nice and fast in the render view. And then the material is this. <laughs> nice and simple. As you can see, sometimes you don't even need to have like a full accurate water material. I just increase my transmission uh, weight to 0.5. It's not even set to one, it's set to 0.5. And then didn't do anything else. And then it just looks like that. It, it's slightly reflective, which is why we get that really nice sort of um, reflection here. It's slightly trans transmissive. And then I also threw, um, did I throw this on there? Or maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't do anything with that. Yeah, that was it, simple. Cool, so yeah, so that was the, that was that. So hopefully that helps answer, answer that for you. Cool, right, so let's, let's go into creating some materials now. So what I'm gonna do, I'm actually just gonna close that down. We don't need to save that. And then let's go to texturing. Cool. Right, while that loads, let me head over to Substance Painter. So very soon I will be doing, I promise I will be doing some tutorials or some streams on actually creating substance painter textures but for now i just want to show you on this pre-created one how we can export these maps and then use them inside of redshift or use them inside of any like render engine or dcc cool so we have our hero mushroom and our mini mushroom as our different texture sets and then in here you can see we have the different layers of our that's making up our final material and then what we can do once we're done, we can come into file, we can go to export textures, and then we get our exporter. In here, we have our output directory. This is where our texture maps are gonna be saved to. We then have our output template, which we can define, but I'm gonna show you how we can do that inside of here. We then have our file, ty file type. So whatever format you wanna create, PNG or JPEG. We then have our size. And so we can choose uh, 2K, 4K, etc. This is set to the texture set size, which Ian set as 2K. So that was perfect. Then what we can do, we can come into our output template. And this is the important section. And so in here, we have some presets. So if you are, for example, a Blender user, then you can click that preset and it's going to give you what it thinks are the most common or mostly used maps for that particular DCC or render engine. 
And if we go all the way down, we can see that we have a redshift preset. And so what we have is color, roughness, metalness, normal height and emission, which is perfect because that's exactly what we need for this particular setup. What we can do is we can add the different types if we wanted to have, or if we had ambient occlusion, for example, we can drag that in and we can add that inside of our map type. Then finally, you'll always want to go over to double check your list of exports. Here you can see all of the different maps that I've got for my hero and my mini mushroom. I can see the size and I can also see the format. Once I'm done, I can then hit export and then in my console, we can see we're going to get our exported texture maps. And I don't need to do that because these are them here for you to see. If I just double click just so you can see what one looks like. This is the hero mushroom base color. And so if you're used to working with texture maps or with UVs, you'll recognize this, this flat look. Cool, let's get rid of that. And yeah, let's head back into C4D and Redshift. And I wanna show you how we can build these up, but more importantly, how we can then customize them. So just like we enhanced and customize our assets, that was kind of like my theme uh, for my NAB presentation and for this whole collaboration, uh, we can also then customize our materials and our textures. Cool. So. Again, let's just give me some room. So let's let's hide our hero character and then let's sort of go up here and let's have a little look and make sure. If you ever wonder why I'm going into my uh, render settings. So by default, when I'm working inside of Redshift to make this as fast as possible, I actually change my progressive passes to either 256 two, or 128. And what that means is you'll notice we get this faster bar and it progressively renders. Everything is a little bit faster. But what it also means is time to first pixel, which is when I first kick off my, my render view or I first refresh it, that time to first pixel is also going to be faster because we have less passes and it's just going to be a less uh, detailed render. But that's fine because it's not a final render. It's just giving me a preview. So it doesn't need to be um, really high. So if you ever wonder why I'm quickly hopping in and out, that's why. All right, cool. So let's have a look at how we can create or, or put together these texture maps. So I'm going to double click, create a new standard Redshift material. And what I'm going to do, so back on the topic of hey, we completely broke apart the mushroom textures and then we deformed them. How are the textures going to match? Well, don't worry, I've thrown them all inside of a null and I throw that material on the null and you're gonna see everything works absolutely fine. So let's open up my node editor and let's start to put these textures together. So let me get my maps. And we're just going to do the hero mushroom and then the rock because of time. So I want my base color all the way down to my roughness and then I'm gonna drag and drop them in. Cool, so we have our base color, we have our metallic, we have our height, our normal, our emission, the order of these doesn't matter. I am just, it's, I've got into a habit of, of positioning them in the node editor based on their inputs on the standard material, but that is just force of habit. You do not need to have that OCD like I do. All right, cool. So how do we build these up? So this isn't just relevant to substance textures. This is texture maps in general. If you've downloaded them from either, I don't know, Polygon, uh, CG Bookcase, Ambient CG, um, which is what I use quite frequently, then this is how you will plug all of this stuff together inside of Redshift. The first thing you do want to do is to change and define the color space. So by default, we're working in ACES CG inside of Redshift. And so what that means is I actually need to change and fix the color space and define this in order to get the right um, color and the right look. 
And so if your texture map is going to be controlling a color input, for example, this base color, we can see we have a color picker. That is what we call a color input. Then it needs to be set to sRGB. And so our emission map will also be a color, a color input. So this also needs to be set to sRGB. Everything that is controlling a numerical input, and so what I mean by that is if we look at our metalness, for example, we have a slider of zero to one. We have a numerical input. So what that means is this is numerical data. It's not color data. And so that needs to be set to raw. And so everything else, which is our metallic, our roughness, our normal, and our displacement, all need to be set to raw. So I can just select all of those, come into here, and then we can go to raw. And then we can connect everything together. So our base color is going to go straight into our base color here. And then we can see it's going to map properly. Once that kicks in, there we go. Now we have that. And then the next one down is our metallic. And before we connect this, I just want to hit this little S key. So if, so if you ever want to see or solo a particular texture map and see how it looks or projects in the render view on your model, then just hit that little S key and then it's going to solo that for you. In this case, my texture map, my metallic texture map is completely black. It's completely one color. We have absolutely no variation. And what that means is we have no metalness values on our object. And so what that means is I don't even need to use this texture map. And so if I just show you inside of here, we have a metalness slider from zero to one. Everything that is 100% black. So in our case, our texture map right now, 100% black is a value of zero. 100% white is a value of one. Everything grayscale in between is varying values of zero to one. What that means is if we have a texture map that is all one color, for example, 100% black, 100% white, we don't need to use it. We can just set this value to what it is, in our case, black, so zero. We can delete the texture map and then we can leave that metalness value on zero. Let me know if that doesn't make sense and we can definitely go through it again. So what that means is we've now got our roughness map. And if we just sort of take a look, maybe I can zoom in here just to make it a little bit easier for you all to see. We can see we have different values here. We have uh, varying grayscale values. So what that means is when I connect this to my roughness input, we're going to have varying percentages or um, parameters of roughness. And so we definitely need that one. We're going to skip past emission because we need to do some extra steps for that. And we're going to come straight down to our normal map. For this, we need to grab a bump map. This is going to tell Redshift that this is to be considered as a normal or a bump map. We need to change our input map type. If you're working with a grayscale bump map, leave it to height field. If you're working with a normal map, then you can choose the tangent space normal. And then we connect everything together and then we can reduce our height scale because we're working with small cell scene. So I can reduce this down. And again, just to look, our displacement map, we actually don't have any displacement, it's just completely gray. So I'm going to delete that. But if you wanna know about displacement, I'm not gonna cover it today. None of these materials have, have displacement, I don't think. Um, but go over to the Maximum Training Team YouTube channel, Redshift Quick Tips. I'm pretty sure it was the second one I ever did was on displacement. So if you wanna learn about it, head over to there. Okay, cool. So. Now let's set up our emission. At the moment, we don't have our emissive input. We can right click and we can go through all the long list and we can add the input. Or quick tip time, we can go into the base properties. And if you command or control, click one of these little dots. So if I come in again, one of these little dots, not this one, this is your keyframe one. This is your input one. If I command click, it adds that input for me. Nice and quick, nice and easy. 
And then what I need to do, I need to switch on my emission. And the way that we can enable properties inside of Redshift is to increase the weight value. So if I increase the weight value to two, we can see we're now getting some bright white emission. That's because my color is set to white. But let's put our texture map in. And now we're going to see that we get our emissive texture. So this is, these are the texture maps. This is how the material looks when I first throw it in. And so from here, it then becomes a question of, okay, I don't think the colors necessarily are matching. So do I go back to substance and change them? Or do I do it inside of Redshift? Well, if it's just a case of color correction and this type of tweaking and customizing, then we can absolutely do all of this inside of Redshift. We don't have to go back to a different piece of software. We don't have to go back to Substance at all. I can do everything inside of here. So let's do that. Let's first off just turn off our emission because again, we'll just deal with that later on. And what I want to do is my base color, because this is where my color is coming from, this is what I want to color correct. So if I double click, we have a color correct node. Again, spelling color correctly for you all. And if I just highlight it over the branch, it automatically adds it for me. And then inside of here, we have access to different color correction tools, gamma contrast, hue saturation, and levels. And then we can start to change, customize, and play around with these, these materials and these textures to make it match the aesthetic and the color and the lighting a lot more. So for this, I'm gonna boost my levels up to something like four. And already that just looks a lot better. And we can play around with the hue a little bit. We're gonna have some more kind of like fantasy, fancy colors. So I went with more of a pink and then I found it was a little bit too saturated. So I pulled that down. Then maybe even sort of increasing the gamma to increase some of this lightness. And remember the reason this looks so flat is because overall I wanted a more uh, flat and desaturated look because then in post or in compositing, I can do all my color grading, I can do all my editing uh, without having to mask out different elements because we have different levels of um, saturation. Cool, so this is what we got, happy with that. Now what we can do, we can switch back on our emission. And again, I personally don't think it's a complementary color. I don't think this sort of this, this uh, turquoisey mint green really goes with the, the color of, of like the color palette that we've sort of started to put together with our lighting and with our other textures. And so what we can do is we could, you know, we could color correct this again. But what I like to do personally, when it comes to emission and emission maps, I like to use a ramp. And there's two reasons why I like to use a ramp. So let's just throw that ramp in there. And let's just solo that. The first reason is it allows me to tweak the amount of emission. So we can see we have our black and white knots on our ramp. And we can see that we have our black and white, sort of our black and white values here. So I can tweak the amount of emission that's happening without having to go back into Substance Painter. And I can also recolor it again without having to. So what I wanna do, we need more emission. There's, there's, too, there's too much black, therefore there's not gonna be a lot of emission going on. So let's just pull this white handle up and then we'll see, we're gonna remap these values. Maybe I want it even more. Cool, so we now have this nice uh, emission mask or map going on. Now, if I unsolo that, we'll then see our emission on here and we're getting that nice white and I said this during my NAB presentation I'm gonna say it again I kind of wish I left these white because I really like the look I ended up going with with like a purple um, so if you wanted to recolor it all you have to do is in the ramp you recolor the white knot um, so yeah let's go with sort of maybe a 
like a purple color. I think this is why I went with maybe a little bit darker. Um, that's how you would then recolor that. So really quickly, just to sort of talk on Sharon's question on the color correct node, is there a way to put a specific color for the hue? Unfortunately, not. But a potential, a potential workaround would be to use the color layer and then do some, some playing around with the blending modes. That would get you closer. Um, but no, unfortunately, in there, as far as I'm concerned, uh, please, if I'm wrong, everyone, let me know. Uh, but as far as I know, I don't think you can add that. I'm very sorry. But yeah, maybe color layer, and maybe we can do some stuff with blending modes. Might be able to get you a bit closer. Okay, so that was how I then customized this particular texture. And now I want to take you through just really quickly. We've got some time. We've got some time. I want to take you through creating the rock texture as well. So this is what, again, I didn't really get around to. So let's go back to this. And yeah, let's create a new standard material. And we're going to throw that on the rock. So my, my theme behind this particular material is thinking outside of the box. And sometimes breaking the rules is... Is, is good, it's like, go for it. Like, it's the end of the day, it's about the final outcome. It's not necessarily about how you got to it. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that, by using texture maps in perhaps a different way um, than you would expect them to be done. So what I showed you with texture maps, how you connect them, how you combine them, the inputs, that is the, the common and the standard go-to way of doing things. But by no means does it mean you have to do things that way. So what I did um, when I was looking for this, remember this is the asset that we created. So we don't have a UV, I didn't UV this, I didn't texture it inside a substance. I could procedurally texture it. That would be, that would be perfect. It would save all my, all my issues. But what I did do is I found a rock texture on ambient CG. And let me just show you just the base color. This was the rock texture. And it came with an ambient occlusion map, a color, displacement, normal, and roughness. I'm not gonna use the base color at all. Oh, we're not gonna use that, goodbye. And instead, I'm going to use a color layer to define my base color. So let's take a color layer. The color layer is really nice. I went through this again in last month's stream. Yeah, last month's to do like procedural texturing. Think of it as like Photoshop layering. You can then create different colors. You can create different masks. You can layer up a variety of different things, including textures. And then you can also define your blending modes for them. So I think I ended up with maybe a color a little bit like, a little bit like this. And then we can plug that straight into our color. And now we can see we have this nice color on our, on our rock. And then what we can do is, or then what I decided to do was I decided to take the ambient occlusion mask from this rock texture. Let me just move that over and get that. And so first off, let me just solo this. I want to show you what problems you may come across when you do this workflow. So as I said, this isn't a UV uh, model. And so when I throw this rock texture on, you'll notice, or hopefully you can notice through, through the stream, that it's not projecting properly. Everything's sort of like going in to a point. And this is because of my UVs. But what if I don't have the time to UV? Or what if I don't want to have to do that? What if I don't know how to do that? Well, inside of Redshift, we can actually, there is a trick that we can use or there's a node we can use that is going to fix this for us. And it's not necessarily a... Uh, one node solves, solves all, but in this case, it definitely does. And that is something called a triplanar node. So if I just drop that in here, we can see we have something called same image on each axis. Then we have an image for the X, Y, and Z axis. In my case, because I want this, this individual texture map to project correctly over the whole of my surface or the whole of my model, 
I'm going to leave it as it is. And I'm just going to input this to my image X. Now, if you keep an eye on this, as I then solo my triplanar, we've now fixed that projection. And all we've had to do is add a triplanar. From here, we can then go back into our texture map and we can adjust some of the remapping. So if you want more of your texture map to be tiled over, so let's say you want to have like smaller detail, then you want to scale it up. Now it's going to tile more over the surface. If you wanted to have it um, larger and therefore tile less, you'd go down in scale. Cool. And then really quickly, because this is going to be connected into a color input, let me just change that to sRGB. And then what I did was I connected this into my layer one color. And then I defined my blending modes. Again, really similar to Photoshop. So I'm going to set this to multiply. And now it's multiplied my ambient occlusion map, which I've now remapped and projected correctly using this setup with that blue. And we've now got this. From here, we can then look at adding maybe more of those same texture maps. So for this, I'm going to take the normal and the roughness. So these are the same texture as this rock. And so what that means is, because it's the same setup, I need to match what I did with the original texture. Otherwise, they're not going to line up correctly. So what that means is I need to grab a triplanar again for both of these. And then I also need to set this to raw. And then I just need to remap these again to two by two, just to match that first one. And we can connect all these together in the same way as before. Grab ourselves a bump map. And then just change that in here. Again, it's all the similar stuff that we did in that same texture, that substance texture. OK, so this is what we have so far. Um, yeah, so from now, from now, we can even do some color correction on this just to make sure it matches in the aesthetic. So maybe we go to 0.4, make it a little bit brighter. Maybe we can do the same on the levels. And then finally, this is sort of on the on the topic of thinking outside of the box and breaking those rules. We don't have a, an emissive map. It didn't come with one. But what if I wanted to create some emission? Well, we can take advantage of this AO setup and then we can remap it and recolor it with a ramp. And then we can use that as our emissive texture map. Let's grab a ramp. And then let's just plug this in. So this is the AO and the triplanar. Plug that into our alt input, and then we're just going to solo our ramp. And then we're going to see how this looks. And cool, this is what we've got. We've got our black and white. And so remember, our white and our bright areas or our color is going to be our emission, and our black is not going to be emissive. And so as we can see here, we actually have it the wrong way around because I want those little shaded AO areas to be emission. Whereas at the moment, most of it most of the whole rock is going to be emissive. And so I could just change the colors of these, or I could just flip them around. And then again, we can tweak them and remap using these handles. Cool. So we're getting, we're getting closer. Now we just need to add our emission input. So let's just unsolo our ramp. And we're going to do what we did before. We are going to command click, increase the weight, and then we're going to plug our ramp into our emission color. And then in our ramp, again, all we need to do is recolor that white knot. So we could, again, just find like, I don't know, like a, like a purple color. And now we have our emission on here. And all of this is based on just this AO, 
this AO map. And so this was how I built up these textures. These were the two that I edited and customized the most. Everything else was, so for example, the hero character, that was just really putting the texture maps together and adding them to the relevant object. Some of them I color corrected uh, a little bit, but not as, not as much as I did with these. So yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how you can customize these and how we can do some color correction. And if things don't quite match, there's a lot of stuff that we can do inside of Redshift that's going to save us having to either find a new texture or having to go back into the original software, in our case, Substance Painter. And a lot of it can be done inside of here. So question from Sharon, before we move on, if you're going to add a ramp to the normal, do you add it before the bump after the triplanar? So I wouldn't suggest using a ramp for the for a normal map um, because if we just sort of come into here. So yeah, I wouldn't necessarily use a ramp for, um, why can't I move in here now? Apparently I can't move around my node editor, never mind. Yeah, so I wouldn't recommend using that for the normal because of the colors. You don't want to, you don't really want to recolor this. Um, I guess it'd be what's the, what would the purpose of the ramp be? If it's to intensify the normal, all of that can be done inside of the bump map. But what you could do is if you have a, a grayscale bump map, so if I want to change how much bump, that would all be done inside of the height scale. So yeah, so the intensity of the bump would be inside of the height scale here. And so I wouldn't recommend using a ramp on the normal. That being said, if you have a grayscale height map um, where it's not a normal, it's just a bump map, then you could potentially put that inside of a ramp and then you could tweak your black and white or your grayscale values uh, that way. But for your normal, yeah, if you want to add some more intensity, then do that inside of the bump map, high scale. Okay, pull that back down. Okay, finally, we've got, got a little bit of time, got a little bit of time left, maybe about 10 minutes. Let's talk about AOVs. So let me just close this down and let's open up my final project, which is, AOVs, cool, while well, that's loading. So AOVs, what are AOVs? Well, it stands for Arbitrary Output Variables. Basically what they are is they are our multipasses or our layers. And so normally when we render straight out of Redshift, we get what's called a beauty pass. So our final render, our final lovely looking render is what we'd call our beauty pass. And what that is, is it is one color per pixel. That's your default, that's your beauty pass. But what we can do inside of Redshift is we can actually configure different shading elements. For example, shadows, reflections, refractions, which we can then export as a separate multipass or a separate layer. And the benefit of working this way or the benefit of having these layers is when it then comes to editing in post or compositing things together, we then have full control of those particular elements. So let's say this scene, for example, I set up all my lighting on different multipasses and then I rendered everything out. It took however long. And then, I don't know, my creative director tells me, no, I want the colors, I want the lighting to be more dim or more orange or more warm, et cetera. Instead of having to go back into Cinema 4D or my DCC and change my lighting and re-render, if I have access to all of those different passes with that lighting information, I can do all of this inside of compositing for example, inside of After Effects. And so it's gonna save you so much time uh, by being able to set up a range of things. 
And so I'm going to show you how we can set these up and what you may need to think of, because it's not a case of being like switch AOV on and it, it being done for you. It takes a little bit of configuration. So again, let me just reduce that down and then maybe we can, is that off as well? Let's switch that off just to make this as fast as possible. Cool, so inside of my render settings, if you wanna start looking at AOVs, inside of our Redshift Advanced tab, we have a little AOV tab. And then we have our AOV manager. So if I just select that, it then opens up this AOV manager for us. And then we have all of our different uh, shading elements or possible passes on the left-hand side. So as you can see, we can control and render a variety of different things. As a starting point, if you are first working with AOVs and you wanna start compositing and you want to begin to create that beauty pass, that, that final render, then your go-tos, your go-to AOVs, or most commonly, are going to be your diffuse lighting, your GI, or your global illumination, your reflections and your refractions, probably your shadows, and your specular lighting. These are probably your six that you are going to want, no matter what you're making, potentially. And so let me just kick this off because I want to show you, if, if you've never worked with AOVs before, uh, we can actually see them inside of our render view so we can get an idea of how they're going to look. And so inside this drop down here, we can see we have our beauty. So our beauty pass is our main final render. We can even throw that in here if we wanted to as well. And then as I drop down, you'll notice all the AOVs that I've now added can be found inside of here. So we have our diffuse, we have our GI, we have our shadows, all of those things. And this gives you an idea of how the pass is going to look. So from here, it then becomes a case of looking at what's in your scene and deciding what you need to then aid or have control of in compositing. So in my case, I have a lot of emission in my materials. Um, and when I spoke to Chad, so Chad is um, an amazing uh, Maxon trainer who actually comped these together at NAB. And I'll show you, I'll link you to the presentation later on. And so he said, oh, it'd be really nice to have an emission pass to then add some glows or some flickering. And so for that, we'd just drag in our emission. He also wanted a depth pass. So if we wanted to control our depth of field inside of there, we can add our Z depth and then we would just change our depth to Z normalized. This then bases the depth on the camera near far. So if we go into our ridge of camera, we have our near far here. What we can do is we can actually disable that and then we can choose our minimum and maximum depth in centimeters if we wanna have more control. And I'll show you what these look like. Then another option. So in here, I've not got my volumetric clouds, but in the final I did. So I'd have my volume lighting. And then the final two are cryptomat and puzzle mat. And so what cryptomat is going to do is if I throw my cryptomat in, up to a certain depth, it's going to add a different ID or a different color to my different objects. And then what we can do, or what uh, Chad's able to do, is he's able to mask out those different elements later on in compositing and have full control of them. Puzzle that is a slightly different method. So he said to me, it would be nice to be able to mask out some of the main elements. So he said, could we, have a mat or a mask for the hero rock, the hero mushrooms and the water. And so for that, for more control, I would use a puzzle mat. So if I take my puzzle mat, I'm gonna set my mode to object ID. And so what this means is I need to define my different channels, the different ID numbers for my channels, and then I need to set up my different object IDs on my different um, objects I want to mask out. 
So let's set red ID to one, green to two, and then blue to three. Then what we can do, let's go in and let's find our hero rock. And then the way that we can set up our object IDs is by adding a Redshift object tag, coming into object ID, and then defining the correct ID. So this is going to be my red ID, so I set it to one. Then my hero mushrooms, I'm going to set my ID to two. And then my water, I'm going to set my ID to three. Okay. So in order to see things like depth, cryptomat, and puzzle mat, we need to bucket render inside my render view. So if I kick these off, And let me just change my system to 256. So deep rendering. So when it comes to Cryptomat, it requires deep rendering. And you can't do that on um, the bucket size of 512. So bear that in mind if you're rendering Cryptomat. Uh, drop your bucket size to 256. Let's just bucket render a little bit of this. And then let's choose my puzzle map. So now what we did, we set up our different channel ID numbers, and then we assigned the RS object tag and the correct object ID to them. And then what Chad can do is he can mask out these different channels later on in compositing. And then we can see this is our crypto map. And then this is our depth. Cool. So just before we wrap up, if you are rendering, if you're working with AOVs and you're rendering out an animation, the chances are you're not going to want um, an individual AOV pass for each individual frame. So if we have like 10 AOVs, you're going to end up with 10 layers or 10 passes per frame. That's a lot of files. So what we can do is we can create what's called a multi-part EXR. And so what it will do is it will create one uh, EXR file, which has all of those multi-passes uh, inside of it. And the way that we do that, back in our render settings under our AOV tab, we can do a multi-part EXR. We can then define our depth. I ended up doing a full float 32 bit. And then inside of our save, we can choose to save our multi-pass image. So this is important. So this is your standard beauty pass. This is your multi-pass image. Again, format, 32-bit depth, and then a multi-layer file. And this gave Chad an entire uh, individual OpenEXR file that's got all the different layers in. Cool. So finally, actually, that's a lie, not finally second from last thing I'm going to talk about is if you are doing a multi-part EXR, but you do find you also want an individual file for, let's say, one of them. So let's say maybe my mission pass, I do want a separate file for. I can come back into my AOV manager, select my mission AOV, go to direct, enable that, and then I can choose my direct output. Again, that is enabled, and I can choose my uh, format and my, and my type inside of here. So we can do that for the relevant passes. You'll see Cryptomat does it by default. It is a default um, direct pass. OK, actually, finally, <laughs> I've been asked uh, a few times recently about how to create an alpha channel. So how to create a image with a transparent background. And I just wanted to take five minutes to show you how to do that before I, before I wrap up. So for the sake of this, let's just close that down. And let's just stick to a real basic scene. So I'm going to do a plane and then maybe like a platonic. And let's just make this a little bigger. Cool. So we'll just keep it nice and simple so it renders like super fast. Look at redshift, low. And then system 512. Um, cool. Read really a little bit of lighting, don't we? Let's get a dome light and then let's get my go to HDR. Cool. So the important step here, a couple of important steps. So this is what this looks like. Beautiful. 
So the important step, we do need to make sure our background is switched off in our dome light, in our HDR. We also need to make sure if we are working with the Redshift camera, which now has a backplate option, that that is also set to off or render settings or something. This, this needs to be the case. This needs to be off. Don't do what I did, accidentally leave it on, then wonder why you're not getting a transparent background. I did that for a while. Okay, so how do we create and how do we render our alpha channel or our transparent background? What we're gonna do, we're gonna come into our into our save. We don't need our multi-pass. We need to define our pass. So alpha, you can see I was testing it earlier. Let's do alpha underscore test. Make sure you're choosing a format that can support it. So in our case, let's just do a PNG. And then we just wanna enable this button here, this alpha channel button. Now, when we render, it will render this with a transparent background. And I can show you this by just coming into here. And we go to desktop, where did I save that? And then we have our alpha. So this is what we just rendered. You can see we don't have our background. We have this nice transparency. On this, if you happen to be working with transparent materials, this is really important. And you want them to be affected by the refraction or by the alpha. Let me just um, change the color of these. So we have, let's go with like a pink. And then let's create some glass. Let's maybe go like that and increase that. Um, yes. So in this case, if we want this to be affecting um, our alpha, we do need to come into Redshift, Advance, System and Legacy. This is sometimes when things get updated and you wonder uh, how you can get back to the previous version of said update. Check legacy. Chances are um, everything, they try and make things backwards compatible by adding an option to revert back to the legacy option. And this is what they did for this. So we just need to enable refraction effects alpha. Render this again. Yeah, sure, let's override it. Why not? And then this will take a little bit longer, a couple more seconds because, you know, it's transparency. And then what we can do once that's done, I can throw it in. I can show you how it's now going to affect this. So we can bring this in here. Let's get rid of this one. And then let's throw that in there. And now you can see that it's affecting the background. If I didn't have that enabled, if I didn't have that uh, refraction effects alpha enabled, then you won't be able to see um, the background here at all. You wouldn't be able to see anything. It would just be black. So that's how you're able to do that. Okay, so I've got a little bit over what I'd normally do, but hey, perks of a, of a live stream. Um, let's have a quick look. If anyone has any questions, let me know, but I'm gonna now go back through and just double check. Uh, thank you for the lovely comments as well. So quick question from Sharon. Is there any specific setting for Reg for Aces if you want to make sure you can adjust all of those lights the best way? I, I wouldn't say so. So the thing is what I ended up doing, I ended up using a view transform of tone mapping as opposed to Aces CG. So those of you that use aces, what you'll notice is when you do a render, it's um, a particular color, and then it almost looks like a LUT is applied later on. That is the view transform. That is the aces transform happening afterwards. Um, that's that's nice. That's great. We can also now um, choose that same aces um, color gamut or color space inside of After Effects. So that would have worked well. But I find because it is a wider color gamut, we get more... Uh, vibrant and saturated colors. But what I wanted to do, I wanted to give Chad a, a much flatter and less saturated version of 
that. So I didn't actually want to apply that ACES transform. So I ended up doing um, tone mapping. So I can show you where to find that. So we can actually, we can do it straight inside of the settings. So as you can see, yeah, by default, we have our display as sRGB and our view set to ACES. So I ended up changing this to Untone Map. You notice it, it changes that because it's a different color gamut and that worked better for him. Um, then again, it's, you know, it's, it, it's preference. If you're working with ACES inside of Redshift and Cinema 4D, then if you need your colors to match, then you will also need to be working inside of ACES. Um, I am not super experienced when it comes to the understanding of color management. Um, but if you do want to know more, Max has his own uh, color grading workshop, which is the alternate Thursdays to Ask the Trainer. Um, but yeah, that's where you can change that. You can also change it inside of your render settings. So inside of globals, you can change it inside of there as well, inside of the, the untone map. Cool. Yeah. So I went with Untime Mapped for that. Cool. Um, right. Okay. Just have another quick th flick through. Hero Mushrooms. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to make this project file available. I mean, not this one, because I mean, that wouldn't be very nice, would it? But the actual final one, it may not have the hero character, but it should have everything else and all of the textures for you. Um, quick one here. What's the overall advantage of multipasses? I assume it's worth the more complex workflow. So the the main benefit of working with multipasses is the is having so much control in post and compositing that the likelihood of needing to re-render is reduced. So I was sort of explaining at the at the beginning when I was talking about AOVs. Uh, let's say you lit something in a particular way, you did some like cool lighting, so some some bluish hues and things like that. And then and you rendered and you thought oh, it would look nicer with warm lighting or someone says to you, the, the client says to you, no, I would rather have some warmer lighting. If you've rendered your multi-passes, your AOVs, and you have access to all of that lighting, those lighting elements and that data on those different passes, you could actually edit that inside of software of choice, for example, After Effects, without having to go back and re-render all of that again with your new lighting. And so that is one of the benefits. What you can also do, for example, I had some clouds in my scene, so I rendered a volumetric lighting pass. If I chose to not want those anymore or change the colors of them, if I have that pass, I can do all of that later. Basically, it it's it will work to speed up your speed up any adjustments or things that you need to do later on it can also work really well if you want to really get into color grading if you want to be adjusting um all of the all of those different things there's there's lots of great reasons and i'll show you the um the link to chad's uh, nab presentation where he actually composited these um and hopefully it'll that will help as well to to show you the benefits of, of that. Just having a little look. Um, yeah, everyone's loving the OCD, for sure. Cool, I think that's everything. Let me know if there's anything um, that I did miss and just let me know. Um, yeah, so very quickly, if, if you wanna know what to do with these particular passes, then I would recommend NAB 2023 day two, where Chad actually takes all of the different passes that I set up for this. And he shows you how you can comp them together inside of After Effects, how you can then make adjustments, change the, the lighting. So he turns it into like a nighttime scene, all in sort of under an hour. So definitely, I definitely recommend checking, checking that out. Cool. Well, yeah, that that being said, we're about an hour and 45 in. Thank you so much to everyone who's here, everyone who who stayed live, all the lovely comments. I, as always, I really, I really do appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed diving into the sort of fancy worlds and NAB part two. Uh, it is always my pleasure. And I, yeah, 
I will catch you all on another stream soon or on my May stream in a month's time. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Have a good week. And yeah, I will see you all soon. Bye, everyone.